Good evening from New York City. Thank you for being with us for live from NYPL. My name is Shala Lynch. I'm the curator of the Moving Image and Recorded Sound Division at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, a research center at the New York Public Library dedicated to the collection, preservation, and interpretation of materials focused on the global Black experiences. We collect what Arturo Schomburg, the founding curator and collector named the vindicating evidences of Black history and culture. I'm also a documentary filmmaker and a 2016 member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, whose work is honored. Um, documentaries have been collected by the library, Chisholm 72, Unbought and Unbossed, and Free Angela and All Political Prisoners. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's conversation with three-time Hugo Award-winning author, N.K. Jemison and comedian, and her cousin, W. Kamal Bell. The reason we're here tonight to be in conversation is Nora's newest book, The City We Became. It is the first in a new trilogy that's set right here in New York City. The City We Became is available for purchase through the library shop. Um, you can go to nypl.org slash shop to get your signed copy now. Not only um, will you be purchasing one of the best books of 2020, but proceeds from your purchase will go to benefit the New York Public Library. The other reason we're here is that Nora's book, The Fifth Season, which was the first book in her previous Broken Earth trilogy, is on NYPL's list of the 125 books we love. That list, which, was, which we released earlier this year, celebrates the library's 125th anniversary by honoring 125 titles from the past 125 years that made us fall in love with reading. It is her voice through her work we celebrate tonight. So when Nora asks on her website, how long till Black Future Month, well, I say the time is now for, not, for us to not only imagine the Black future, but also to reimagine the present and the past. It's time to be Afrofuturistic, which is to say, shake off old stereotypes and comfortable tropes around race. And for all of us, Black, White, Latino, Asian, to do the work and boldly bridge the remaining two-fifths divide for us and with Black people, so we can fully experience in the law, at work, and in our daily lives, um, equality and without fear. The vindicating evidence is our voices are there, whether it is from the past, present, or looking into the future. The work, your work, our work, is to engage them and listen. The good news is the library offers the tools through the items collected by the Schomburg Center and other research libraries here or created by W. Kamal, and of course, the books written by N.K. Jemison. So let's start with tonight's conversation. Um, before I bring Nora and Kamal on, a, a couple of quick notes, and then I'll get out of the way. Uh, this event is being simulcast on Zoom and YouTube. If you're in the Zoom event, please note that it's being recorded, not you, only the event itself. Nora, We'll be glad to answer some of your questions at the end of the conversation. You can send them anytime by typing them into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the Zoom app. She will get to as many of them as she can. Um, at the end of the event, we'll be sharing a short two question survey with you and we'd love your feedback if you have a second. Uh, we'll post a link to it towards the end of the event, both in the chat on Zoom and comments on YouTube. Lastly, the library has a lot of great online events coming up, including a short series on the history of pride next week. And this Friday, the Schomburg celebration of Juneteenth featuring Carla Hall, their Nelson, Rootstock Republic, and more. If you wanna learn about these events and everything else the library is doing during this time, despite the pandemic, um, visit nypl.org slash connect, where you can sign up for our newsletter and also access the myriad of digital resources we are making available during this time. Okay, thank you so much. Now let's bring on our featured guests to be in conversation, W. Kamal Bell and N.K. Jemison. Hello. 
Hi, hang on a second. We're still there. there we go. go. All right. Sorry, Zoom is a little sluggish. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Harry. Hi. Hi. So uh for the hundreds of people who are watching on Zoom and the who knows how many people on YouTube, although now that I found it is on YouTube, I feel a little scared, but I'll get through it. Uh <laughs> I just want to say that we will talk about the book. We've actually allocated a lot of time for questions, but actually I don't get to talk to my cousin that often. So <laughs> I'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk to my cousin. Uh, we are real cousins. Can you confirm that, Nora? Yes, we are real cousins. We get that question every like five minutes on Twitter. Yes, yes. Every and, time and I, we answer and I, it and then nobody ever pays attention. Yes. <laughs> but, I think it's the tradition of black people saying cousin that means a lot of things. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, so what is it? Technically we are uh, once removed, twice removed. I can't remember like I don't the remember. layering. Uh, Wikipedia laid it out and I was like, oh, is that what it is? Somebody on Wikipedia edited it because really, your okay. mom is my first cousin yeah. because that's how the South works. Well, yeah, basically. <laughs> so, so anyway, whatever, yeah. cousins, it works. Cousins. I think it, importantly, the cousin it means something because we actually did spend significant time as kids hanging out together especially yeah. as little kids yeah. uh, and you know i started i've i i wrote about it in my book we've talked you've talked about it before we were just literally two kids in our grandmother's house like the two weirdos <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we were that well. Okay, yeah, we were. Um, I mean, yeah, for Mobile, we Alabama, pretty, we, we were pretty we were weird. Mobile, Alabama weirdos, not New York City weirdos or Bay Area weirdos, but you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we were two little nerdy black kids who like to sit around, um, you know, make up weird games. Um, like I remember, we didn't have Legos, but we had Grandma's empty spools, and we built things with the empty spools because whatever same difference <laughs> um and and i mostly did lots of reading and you did lot I, I had i started writing i guess i had i, I mean my have. my earliest memories of you i mean we did a lot of things we also mm -hmm. just ran around and got dirty as well kids. yeah that too you know, you know and but nine thousand mosquito bites yes but like i my early memories of you are you writing like i felt like i remember mm. us working on things together but certainly like as you became an adult and you were writing, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Like that was not, yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember, I remember us talking about like TV shows and stuff. And then sometimes like we would exchange ideas where like you had some superhero that you were trying to draw or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and I wanted would... to be a, a comic book artist and success. We all got what we thought we were gonna be. <laughs> well, I mean, you're a comic. Yes. <laughs> not book artist, but you no, know, yeah. close enough. Some, something like that but yeah. yeah yeah well I mean but we were we were two little nerdy kids who liked to bounce the nerdiness off of each other and it had an effect um you know even if those effects were somewhat unexpected in a few cases but you know yeah. that was yes. the end result I mean so sitting where you sit now in in space from the Zoom background <laughs> Ooh, I think this question that, that I, that's really fitting for me yes yes uh I think the question that I'm going to ask you is a question that I, that I think about for myself. How, because mm. we're two kids who sort of had these big, impossible sounding dreams. Mine mm. was sort of like comic book artist, kung fu movie star, stand up comedian. So I sort of like, I, it was a little all over the place, but I got one of them. How much of your life is like, this is exactly what I expected when I was a little kid drawing? And how much of your life is like, this is not anything I could have imagined? Because you basically. Yeah. Have, Three-time Hugo Award winner. You didn't know what a Hugo was at the time, but that's the you have you have, you want. Yeah, you won. What does it feel like to win? I mean, I I did know what Hugos were because oh. when I would go to the library in Mobile, um, you know, and the librarians would try to help this this poor child that wandered in and was like, "Give me the science fiction." Um, they would basically go and look for like the Hugo list or the Nebula list, and they would just kind of go down the list because none of them read science fiction. Um, they would go down the Hugo or Nebula list, and they would give me the books from that. So you know, I had a vague idea that Hugo meant the books the library liked. So, and I mean, and that's kind of true. So you know, so it worked. Um, when I was little though, I did not expect to become a writer. I, you know, I, 
basically I had kind of assumed that there was no future for me in writing science fiction, um, that this was a fun thing to, to read, a fun thing to do, um, but you know, it was not a thing that, that black women did. Um, black women, you know, I was a little vague on the fact of whether black women became writers until I met your mom. Um, and, you know, basically at that point, you know, Aunt Janet, uh, I remember at one point she came to visit and I had basically, mom had told me that Aunt Janet was a writer and like automatically it was just like, what? And so like basically when Aunt Janet showed up, I was kind of like hovering in the background with my little terribly made handmade book that was made of like two pieces of, of cardboard that I had covered in construction paper and bound with yarn. And I was just sort of hovering in the background and I was like, I have to show her this book, but what if she doesn't like it? And da -da 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 -da, like complete like, you know, conniptions. And I remember showing it to her and she was so patient and she looked through that book. She said it was good. I was like, oh my God, I can write, <laughs> um, you know, and, and she gave me some of her own books. We talked a little bit about writing. I had no idea what questions to ask, but like, but that ended up being a formative experience. I think it was probably like one day, um, maybe a couple of hours. Um, and I basically just pestered that poor woman to death. Um, but but it was a formative experience. I met an actual living black woman who wrote books, um, who had said that I could write, and and that opened up lots of doors for me. Um, I still didn't like try to become a writer. Um, you know, for ages it was just kind of like you know I I don't think I can make a living at this. So let me go on and become a psychologist. That's exciting. Um, you can make lots of money in psychology. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, but, you know, it, it, I needed that sort of early formative stuff. So thanks, Aunt Jay. Yeah, she's, I think she's on there somewhere. In the, in Is the she? I feel like I should text her just to make sure. <laughs> Actually, okay. I'm going to text her just to make sure. So oh, a lot go There's so much nothing going on right now that she might have forgotten. Oh, Are no. you watching <laughs> me and Nora? All right. Well, she'll, get, she'll definitely get back to me. Nice. Uh, I mean, I would imagine that my mom saw the saw in you herself. Like she was a little black girl from Indianapolis, Indiana, which Indianapolis, Indiana is more related to Mobile, Alabama than I think Indianapolis would like to admit. As far as like, <laughs> weirdly, Indianapolis, Indiana is kind of the deep south, oh, <laughs> like, especially wow. in 1937 when she was born. Yeah. yeah so, she's told me about like the the famous clan presence and all of that. Yeah, yes. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's it's an interesting place to grow up as a black woman being from a place known for its clan uh, affiliations, I think. <sighs> yeah, so it leaves you with two choices. You either sort of like accept it and deal with it or get the F out, which we know and, my mom And did. grow up to be like hardcore like Aunt Janet did. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm sure she saw yeah. I don't think she had those role models who came into her life who would have encouraged mm -hmm. her to be a writer because she came to writing sort of mm -hmm. much later than you did. Or came oh. back to it much later. She started because I don't think there was any, there was not some sort of magical aunt who was going to float through and say mm. you can be a writer. You know, mm. yeah. she had yeah. You know, yeah. she was she was encouraged to be a domestic. Hey. I mean, you know, back in those days, that was like an an aspirational career. You know, so yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's one of the reasons why, like, even to this day, um, like, I participate with, like, a bunch of uh, organizations that I, well, not a bunch, um, but a few organizations where I get a chance to kind of, like, talk to young Black women, um, you know, young up-and-coming up Black artists of whatever gender, um, where I can try and just kind of be like, yeah, this is a thing you can do. Do you really want to do this? I mean, let me tell you all the crap I got to go through, too. I don't get, like, too detailed because I don't want to discourage them, <laughs> um, but but, you know, I want them to understand that it's at least like a possibility because there's so little else in the world that tells nerdy black kids what you can do with your life um, or what, what possibilities exist for you. Um, you know, so anyway. Especially when we were growing up. I mean, I think that our lives would have looked pretty dramatically different from an earlier mm -hmm. age if the internet had existed. <laughs> well, that could have been a lot worse though. <laughs> well, you know, but on balance, I just feel like we would have, I would have known there were more people out there like me other than, well, my mm -hmm. cousin who I visit in the summer, 
Mm. And I guess that's it. You know, uh, yeah. It would have been nice. It would have been nice. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in science fiction, there's a thing that happened maybe like 10 years ago um, where uh, as part of this whole big long discussion about race in science fiction, basically all of the the black nerds decided that they were going to all hop into this one online chat and be like you know please stand up just basically raise a digital hand um raise a digital hand for your relatives that are giant black nerds um and how many of us really are there out there this is just a sampling of like what we, what, what we can figure out from like five days on the internet mm. and it was thousands of people thousands of people I'm speaking for thousands of others. You know, in my case, I've got you, I've got my father, who I used to watch like the Twilight Zone and and um, uh, old school Star Trek with, you know, every night uh, on Channel 11 in New York in those summers that I spent up here. Um, I had my, my childhood friend Kumari, all of these wonderful people like, nerdiness is just kind of like the 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 idea that we have a future the idea that we are part of that future has always been in our community you know there have always been black science fiction writers including du bois um w.e.b du bois but you know it's just a thing that that we all for whatever reason those of us that came out of the 70s and 80s um somehow lost that belief or lost that realization um, and that's like at every possible chance that I can, I do what I can to kind of try and fight that. As for the record, my mom texted me back. Thanks for reminding me. So. <laughs> <laughs> you just called her out in front of the whole internet. Oh my God, I just, that's funny. Yeah, I, just, I don't know if that makes me a bad son or her. I, uh, anyway, so, no, but yes, she can never so. be, yeah. Yeah, yeah she'll, she she'll could. join us when she, when now I'm like, oh, she's got to figure out Zoom. Oh, this is Oh mess. no, poor thing. Okay. I sent my dad the link. Yeah, I sent my dad a, the link to register and I was like, okay, there's three pages you have to get through. Yeah. First you have to, yeah, so. I'm we'll a blessing release it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I feel like because, you know, we're definitely like hope he's enjoying it. born in the 70s, but children of the 80s is like, you know, so I feel like like we're basically I think of this myself this way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you think of yourself this way. I, I feel like I'm the exact age of hip hop, like when hip hop started <laughs> to bubble up in the Bronx huh. was like I was a, was around the early 70s, like the early, you know, but so was it the me, early 70s. Uh, OK, yeah, players you, ball. You know, I don't know. I have like to the first that. rumblings. I don't, I, I certainly don't want anybody who's listening to New York to get into a hip, when hip hop started war. Oh. I already said the Bronx. So that means I know something. So like, that's good. I don't want Brooklyn Yeah, and I live here, so I can't say anything wrong. So I'm just going to like yeah. stay silent. But yeah, this mm -hmm. is proof, proof of my 80s nerddom that I don't actually have all the hip hop knowledge. Um, mm. Now you can be a hip hop nerd. You could, that's the thing I was going to say is that I've just, there was such a commodification of black culture with the rise of rap music that it felt like, to me as a kid that if I wasn't doing that, which I wasn't, then I was not mm -hmm. really doing blackness right. Can you, yeah. did you yeah. feel that way at all? Or, oh, and I'm not even saying I'm not a fan of rap, but I'm saying that if mm -hmm. you weren't doing all of it. Exclusively that, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there, were, there were gendered expectations, there were racialized expectations, you know, I mean, I'm sure we both experienced a lot of that. Um, you know, I mean, and in my case, it was also sort of like the expectation that you're going to do your hair a certain way, mm -hmm. you're going to dress a certain way, yada, yada, yada. Um, and, you know, I was such a nerd, like I had glasses this big when I was younger and my face was smaller. So like, That's like brilliant. I look at, yeah, I look at pictures of myself from when I was like 15 or something. And it's just like nothing but glasses in the view and like a tiny smile. Um, you know, I mean, and, and I was coming to New York in the summer times. And, and when I was coming to New York, I was hearing a lot of that like early rap and hip hop. Um, I was into it. I was loving it, you know, and I had friends up here who taught me how to double dutch. I was bad at it um, and stuff like that. You need to be coordinated to double dutch. Yeah, that didn't happen. That's one um, of the keys. What do you say? That's one of the keys, yes. I mean, yeah, or that, or you just have to sort of accept that you're gonna get hit in the face with the rope every other minute. So, you know, it just, it happens. Um, but, you know, so I, I did all of that too, but for me, that was also part of me coming to New York in the summer times and sort of um, relaxing into all of myself. Up here, I could be an artist and a nerd and a hip hop head. And no one seemed to treat me differently or act like that was weird. And I think that's probably why 
I decided to write this book that you can't see because of my uh, Zoom background. Wonderful. Uh, I, um, <laughs> your, yeah. your publisher's going to love that. Fantastic. My, yeah. I was supposed to talk about this book at some point. Can I do it if I put it in front of my body? Yeah, that works. Yes. yes. All right. You can see part oh, of it. Now, uh, yeah. Well, so much for that. Um, yeah, I don't want to make my publicist <laughs> mad. So, um, so I have mentioned the book now. Okay. Now let's get back to talking. Um, but yeah, so that's that's basically the how city it. we became. You didn't even say the title. The city oh, we shit, became. Really? Okay. Well, yeah. The book called "The City We Became: First of the Great Cities Trilogy." Um, I got 500 extra words done on book two today. I'm so proud of myself because it has been hard to write in this current environment. So. Well, let's talk about that because I, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I, first of all, we it's funny how much I feel like our lives sort of did parallel each other as far as like the struggle to sort of become an artist. I feel like we both sort of started mm -hmm. to break through a little bit at the, around the same time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was you like, I can't remember what the like you want a Hugo, I want an Emmy. And every time I was like, I want an Emmy, you'd want a second Hugo. And I'd be like, oh, OK. <laughs> All right. I think you beat me to it though. So now like we're you both were on tied TV before you were on TV first, and like I've never been on TV. So well, that's we not. Oh, you first of all, you've been on United Shades of America. How oh. dare you say well, you've never been see, on TV? But I am a guest. I don't have a show. I don't want a show. But you know, it's the principle of the thing. Anyway, like someday somebody's gonna give me like a TV show. I guess. I <laughs> well, it's we, just I, gonna I, consist of me going. Why am I here? I, that's, I, I know an executive, oh, I know an Emmy award-winning executive producer who can help you get a TV show if you really want one. Uh, no, I really don't. Uh, but, <laughs> but I've seen you on Twitter talk about like I like the 1500 words a day thing. Like, you mm -hmm. know, I got my 1500 words in. And then we mm -hmm. talked the other day and you were like, I got, it was a struggle to get to 600. Now you're mm -hmm. saying 500. Mm -hmm. Obviously yeah. we're both using the outside world as our sort of inspiration and mm -hmm. processing it through our internal you know, whatever's going on in our lives. And it's hard to figure out what that mix is, but you were taking in the outside world and sort of trying to fix it through art. <laughs> you know, through and, and it's not fixable right now. That's, that's the struggle. Um, you know, plus also with this Great Cities trilogy, I suppose I should talk about what it's about. Um, it's set in the modern day in New York going through its, its existing problems of gentrification and, and inequality and police brutality and so on. And so I had an outline for all three books of this trilogy set up and 2020 is messing with my outlines. It keeps stealing my ideas. So, you know, like at like, I'm gonna basically like like spoil a little bit because I've got to change it now. Um, but I had intended to put in a collaboration between the NYPD and the Proud Boys where they're they're messing with the city. Well, thanks, America. <laughs> so, so now I'm like, now I gotta redo my outline. I don't even know. Um, so that's part of the problem is yeah. that, you know, reality, when, when you decide to write a story that's set in the real world in the modern day, this is a, a rare challenge that science fiction writers don't usually have to deal with, and now I got to figure it out. Um, but the other piece of it is, you know, it's hard. It's hard to write when you're so angry that, you know, you open Twitter for ten minutes and your blood pressure goes up. You, you, you know, watch something on TV and you realize just how far the world has changed. Like I was watching some movie, I don't even remember, remember what it was, but it was made like back in 2012 or something like mm -hmm. that. And it, it had uh, the world facing danger with like a competent president in charge. You know, who knew? All these disaster movies that were coming out around 2011, 2012, they all posited that we were going to have like Morgan Freeman in charge, mm -hmm. keeping us safe. Well, so what's up, Morgan Freeman? Come on, man. <laughs> Where you? What are you doing? We need you <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. But no, I think that that's the, there's sort of this idea that every, that during when a president, a films come out that sort of reflect the president in charge, and yeah. so in the Obama era, mm -hmm. film and TV and, and media, it's all about outside. The world is fine. There's an outside, like something is, something's happening that is not, the world's not bringing on itself. Yeah. But now your book is sort of reflecting the fact that the world is eating itself alive. <laughs> you know, that the... I mean, and I wrote it almost two years ago. So mm -hmm. um, that was not intentional, obviously. Um, you know, people have talked to me about the uh, congruity that they see between 
um, you know, the, the sort of magical plague that I have spreading through the city and COVID. Well, no, I did not anticipate a global pandemic that would be completely unchecked because we have no leadership. Um, who knew? Um, you know, and there's an instance of, uh, of kind of not so much police brutality, but a woman Karening at the characters at one point. Um, and she's an existential manifestation of, of danger, but she takes the form of a white woman who is filming someone uh, for being basically black in public. And, um, you know, the whole thing that went around a few days, a, a couple of days ago with the, the super creepy white woman who's like, is that your wall? And I had chills. I'm like, oh God, that's, that's her. That's what she looks like in real life. Real life should not be looking like my books. I don't want to live in my books. Nobody wants to live in my books, but we are here. I don't yeah. know what to do about that. I mean, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back a little bit on what you said, because I feel like the same thing happens to me that we'll be working on episodes of United Shades and then they come out and suddenly it's like the episode we did about reproductive justice comes mm -hmm. out around the same time that states are starting to take away, really work hard to take away uh, reproductive rights from, from people who can get pregnant. Yeah. And so I, and, it, and, and I, it's happened a few times and I, I feel like, but when you're doing what we're basically both sort of taking in all this stuff from the outside world and then processing it and trying to imagine it or see through it in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it ends up being like, you're just sort of, we're, we're I mean, I feel like we're basically detectives. <laughs> like, like, you know, sort of like, and we don't know we're doing that, but I think that it's- uh, uh, we're, we're not detectives, we're artists. Yeah. This is what art is supposed to do. Art is supposed to, absorb the energy that the world is putting out. It's not our fault that the world is putting out just crap energy right now. Um, our job is to reflect it and, and translate it and help other people cope with it in whatever way that they can. And, you know, I mean, that's the nature of, that's the nature of that beast. So, you know, if you were a good artist, then, then your writing is always gonna reflect reality to some degree. Um, so, uh, just a warning. Uh, I have grocery deliveries showing up at some point soon. It's, it's fine. It's fine. I may have to run off and go get groceries. I, I can't tell if that's them or not. I'll, I'll vamp. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll figure I'll, it out. We'll, we'll figure it out. I, I can, and I've been, I've been told in the chat that Janet Bell has joined the YouTube stream. <laughs> she is actually, is and I, actually, I got a text too that said that she had, she was like, she said Zoom was, 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 could not let people in. So I've joined, I'm on YouTube. Just oh, Zoom no, with the I capacity. love it. I love it. Yeah, okay. Super. Zoom's at capacity. I didn't know that could happen. All right. Yeah, well, that's all. Let's look how popular you are. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you for showing up here. So, this is great. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I want to, it's sort of, we're talking about black artists and we're talking about black books right now. There's an effort to, you know, last week, the New York times bestseller is just sort of like, because a lot of people were trying to figure out racism, white people mm -hmm. like ended up being sort of like a top, almost a top down, books about racism written by black people. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and now there's an effort to say, let's black out the New York Times bestseller list again, but mm -hmm. also but but not just with... not just those books. Like, you know, black people can do, we can do other things. We write about things other than slavery. Who knew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and it, so... it also made me go, I wish I'd called my book, Hey Racist White People, <laughs> buy this book to become less racist. Cause it would, I feel like it would have had a better chance to be on the bestseller list than the author. Well, you're... And, and people should check out The Awkward Thoughts of W. Kamau Bell, um, which is an excellent examination and metatextual uh, analysis of Black artistry and development. A anyway, okay. I like that. I didn't even know I was metatextual. That's a Yeah, I just pulled that one out of Melissa's uh, over here laughing at things. That <laughs> she really? Out. Hey, Melissa. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so the Q and A is coming up soon. So we'll be taking your questions. I will be the one who decides what question gets asked because uh, that's what I'm here for. So good luck. Um, <laughs> so I would so what people are being asked is to buy two books by black writers this week to help black out the New York Times bestseller list. I'm not gonna. Oh. I, I you everybody knows a black writer. So like, <laughs> I feel like it may not be good to ask you, but I would just encourage the audience to find two books by black writers and if they can also take books out of the library get books out of the library and buy books but buy the books you buy through the new york library i think i covered all my bases yes getting books from the library does help writers yes there's there's no reason not to get books from the library too i'm putting in the plug for the library here so um 
But all right. So I see many questions. I will I let don't you, look at them. I'll, I will let you choose. You look at if you want to. Or okay. you are, you do it. No, no, I'll let you pick. Okay, I'm, I, this one. I'm, this one looks good right away. Uh, it says, "As a queer person, the casual queer representation in your books has meant so much to me. Thank you for, 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 for uh, thank you for providing that for your readers. I'm curious as to why you decided to feature that when it's such a relatively rare thing in sci-fi slash fantasy." Uh, I cannot speak to why it is a relatively rare thing, uh, bigotry. But anyway, um, I was going to say like you so, <laughs> Yeah, all right. Well, but but I mean. Like I said earlier, it is an artist's job to reflect the world as it is, to reflect um, what they are legit seeing in the world. And so I write human beings, even if it's not on earth, I write human beings the way I see human beings. Um, you know, and so that's gonna range across lots of different races, lots of different backgrounds, lots of different abilities. That's, it, to me, it is, it is necessary if I am honestly engaging with human beings or like to show that range of humanity. So um, that that's why. But I mean, I would say like, is, is there any part of it? Cause I feel like this is what I'm doing sometimes. I see this is not happening. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't mean I'm going to just do everything that's not happening. But if I mm -hmm. feel like it's strange, this is not happening. I feel like I can add something here. So I will add something here. Probably that's it too. Um, you know, Lord knows that I, I do put conscious thought into like, am I putting in too many white dudes? Um, because, you know, even, even. <laughs> not a question. It, yes. <laughs> a I mean, I literally do ask my, myself that sometimes because even black women writers, we, we've all in this country, um, and pretty much anybody that's been reading in English, um, we have all read almost nothing but stories featuring and centering on cishet white dudes um, and their interests and their power struggles and da 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 da. Um, and so when, when most of us first begin to write or most of us first begin to draw or whatever art form that we do, um, in a lot of cases, we have to kind of work against that, that weight and that pressure, which kind of pushes us towards that societal norm. And so, yeah, I push against it on a kind of constant basis. Um, you know, and then that does mean that in a lot of cases, um, I am, I am consciously making a choice to write about groups that don't get featured in fiction a whole lot. Um, but I'm doing that not to be like, suck it white dudes. It's not like that. Um, you know, I, I, maybe I do that. I don't know. It's not I mean, really, I don't think there's any, I just want to, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying suck it white dudes. I just don't think that's not that, like, that's not the core of it. You yes, know, I, I, get yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The core of it is, this is what the world looks like. So if I don't know anything about the particular experience I'm trying to write, like with um, the city we became, uh, the character that plays the Bronx is uh, Bronca Siwanoi. Um, she's a, a queer Lenape woman, 60 something years old, um, you know, who was at Stonewall and who kicked in a police informant's knee. Um, she is this badass old lady. I am not a badass old lady yet. I don't have that lived experience, um, but I know badass old ladies and I can do research. Mm -hmm. So, so you were, I did you as were much raised as I could. by some badass old ladies. Basically, one, yeah. One that I'm thinking you know, in particular. Yes, we were both thinking of that one. Um, yeah. But, you know, so, so I did what I could to try and make sure that I was honestly depicting that. Um, and, you know, there are going to be people who, who quibble with the way that I, I choose to do things and I'm going to mess things up. Um, but I feel like it is my, my duty as an artist to do the best that I can regardless. So. So this is this is a very a classic uh, New York borough question that I that it's funny it didn't occur to me until right now and this is why this is why it's classic. Mm. Any blowback from Staten Island readers? <laughs> do you care? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have not this had any blowback. You have to live in New York to know really what this means. Or you can, can you read the book. What's happening here? You, you, you can. I, yeah. Um, so so. In the book, it is made very, very clear in various ways that Staten Island is kind of like the odd borough out in New York in a lot of ways. Um, and this is all just factual stuff. Um, you know, Staten Island is the borough that kind of traditionally goes Republican while the rest of the city goes blue. 
Um, you know, Staten Island has tried to secede from New York a few times. They don't like us that much, um, you know, and so on. And I actually have not had any blowback. Um, so those kind of people don't read your book. No, 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 no. Uh, you know what I think is happening? You know, the, I, I've actually had a few Staten Islanders be like, yeah, yeah, that's us. Um, so um, I, you know, so far so good. Um, you know, I haven't done anything that they find egregiously horrible uh, in in the depiction. So, well, to be to, to be fair to Staten Island, it is the birthplace of the Wu Tang Clan. So that that's has that's one thing they there have. Like, like that makes up for that, a great deal. That's what cool Staten Islanders always want to say. They're like, well, hold on, Wu Tang yeah. Clan, and it's which the, buys them a lot. It buys them a lot, and it's actually where. Uh, my friend Vernon Reed, the guitar player from Living Color, lives. So he gets very right. like he may have actually asked this question. He gets very sort of Staten Island protected. <laughs> protected. Oh wow, really? Okay. Yeah. So uh -huh. but that's you, Vernon. Hello. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a longer question, but I, it's worth it. One of the greatest aspects of the city we became is the astoundingly personal and resonant way the narrative embodies New York City. As the series move, as the series moves forward, and we hopefully meet new cities, or the uh, or the ones we've already met become more nuanced. Are you concerned that they may seem more like caricatures than the carefully detailed depiction of New York City based on your own experiences? If so, how might you address those concerns? Can research ever rival your own experiences? Um, you know, I've already had some issues because like, I had originally been planning a trip to Hong Kong and then basically revolution broke out there and it didn't seem like a good time to travel to Hong Kong. Um, you know, and so like, basically I have not been to uh, Hong Kong or Sao Paulo. Um, I am going to be writing about other cities that I have not visited um, and that is troubling. Um, I've done what I can uh, from my chair to try and address that, like with uh, Sao Paulo, for example, um, I had a, I don't, I don't think it really, she really qualifies as a sensitivity reader. She's more like a Sao Paulo accuracy reader. Um, and she helped me kind of suss out the, the attitudes of other Brazilians towards Sao Paulo, stereotypes about the city, things that Americans wouldn't necessarily even know. Um, and I wanna go to Sao Paulo too, but I'm not gonna be able to do it before like book two is due. So, um, and I mean, I suspect I'm gonna get some problems from that. Um, but at the end of the day, these characters are people. And um, I think that's one of the things that's gonna save me is just simply that because I'm starting with stereotypes, but then I'm building them hopefully into three-dimensional people. And it's up to you guys as readers as to whether I do that successfully or not. And I just got a text saying Fresh Direct is about to show up. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, my, well, my, I can also address my mom wanted me to make it clear that she's a black, she said, your own mother is a black writer as I was talking about black writers, so. Yes. The we just praised you to the nine winds, Aunt Jay. But we didn't name the title of her book, which we that's what she's that's what she's getting to. Oh so she has several books available, but the time and place that gave me life is her memoirs about growing up in Indianapolis. So I'm so sorry, Aunt Jay. Yeah, no, you're in trouble for this too. <laughs> <laughs> all right i'll take it i'll own it uh do you need to go get your fresh direct they haven't rung the doorbell yet they text you before they show up so okay yeah uh so i'm gonna distill this question what are the possibilities and limits of thinking of writing as activism what would you say the responsibilities of a writer dedicated to anti-racism like you are and this is mm -hmm. somebody who's currently in minneapolis mm -hmm. so this okay. is i'm sure this, this is a really but, yeah, that's that's a hardcore question. Um, yeah. I think this is a responsibility of anybody who considers themselves an artist, but you need to understand how humanity works. You need to understand how racism works, how the systemic racism uh, came to be. You need to learn your history. Um, you need to um, understand the, the, the psychodynamics of it to some degree. Um, I actually took a couple of classes on this when I was in grad school, um, so that helped a whole lot. Um, and that was sort of the start of like lifelong learning for me. Um, I read history books for fun. Um, yeah, I'm a nerd still, um, but, I, but I read Nobody history Nobody has books. a problem believing that. <laughs> yeah, well, all right. Right. Okay. Um, but I still read history books for fun. Um, and, you know, because they blow my mind and I try and incorporate what I learn about the world into that. Um, and I've talked about this in my uh, world building seminars. Um, if anybody wants to see one of them, I did one uh, that's online for uh, Wired uh, about uh, sometime last year. Uh, when was the last time I was in San Francisco? 
when was when last time I saw you guys was what six months ago? Yeah, about six months ago, something like yeah. that. Um, so so that was what I was in town for. <laughs> um, and um, so you can see the presentation that I did. Um, if you Google my name in Wired, and you'll probably find it. Um, and it's like a two hour long talk where I talk about how I build the worlds that I do and how I build the people that populate those worlds. And it really kind of comes down to understanding how our world works. You can't create other worlds unless you kind of get our world. Because I mean, at the end of the day, your audience consists of people who are extremely familiar with one world, and that is this one. Um, and it needs the, the, the things that they are reading need to read as plausible to them. So um, I don't know if that answered the question or not. I was just rambling at that point. No, no, no. I think we're, well, okay. we're and sort of connecting it to a writer's response. So you're, uh, the question was about how, basically, I think there's this sort of the pressure as, a, issue. as a, like, should I be doing more than just writing for in the, while the world is burning down? Should I be like, should I, <laughs> like, is it enough to be an anti-racist writer or do I need to be actually on the streets help, you know, it, helping the, you know, in the streets. Mm -hmm. putting I've been asking that question of myself for like the last two weeks now. Um, and I have gone to a few protests, mostly the ones just kind of in or near my neighborhood because NYPD for a while was doing a wonderful little trick where they imposed a curfew um, and said, you got to go home or we'll arrest you and beat the living shit out of you. Um, or, uh, but, but meanwhile, they were also shutting down the subways and closing the bridges and keeping you from leaving so that they had an excuse to do that. That was fun. Um, so I didn't go to anything outside of Brooklyn. I needed to make sure I could walk home. Um, and I only did a few, um, mostly because like my, my, my feeling is that writing is not a substitute for activism. Art is not a substitute for activism. It is a form of activism though. You do have to acknowledge that. Um, so, you know, the way that you choose, uh, I know that sounds a little contradictory. Um, let me clarify. The way that you choose to help change the world is dependent on how much energy you've got and can put out into the world because this stuff does harm to us too. We have to understand that there is danger in engaging on the level that we as artists tend to do. Um, but at the same time, um, you do have a duty to observe. You do have a duty to try and, and reflect and resonate and um, not lie. Um, a really big and important thing that, that I have understood with increasing uh, depth over the course of my career is how damaging uh, fiction can be to reality. Um, if you're not careful about it. I was actually reading a really great thread on Twitter the other night. Uh, I think I reblogged it. Um, and I've forgotten the name of the author who, who put it on. That's terrible. But it was talking about how perceptions of police have changed because of stuff like the TV show Dragnet. Um, because, I don't know if you saw that same thread. No, um, no, I just, I feel like I lived that thread. I feel like I, <laughs> I would say Law and yeah. Order. Like, I feel like the Law and Order franchise has done a lot to like sort of make mm -hmm. the snarky funny cop okay like the mm -hmm. cop who sort of cracks a one-liner at a murder scene like sort of okay you know, like yeah. So, yeah yeah well the thread was talking about uh, and if anyone uh hopefully folks that are in the chat and have the ability to write there can can add that in but uh but you know the, it was talking about the fact that uh i forget his name webb uh the the actor who played the main character in dragnet um was uh really pro-police and he um, made sure that the show would be pro-police. And before that, there had not been a lot of shows that were, you know, the police were kind of treated as like the Keystone cops, mm -hmm. um, as corrupt or funny or bumbling or whatever. Um, and his, that, that one artist's decision to, to fudge how the police really are um, in their depiction um, had these knock-on effects that we're still dealing with. Um, and so like, yeah, artists can do a lot of really powerful things and you need to be aware of the danger of that. You need to be aware of the, the power in that, the, the positivity that you can put forward or the, the help that you can give, um, but you also need to be aware of the harm that you do. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, you're the same person, the same as a person who's out there on the front lines at a protest, um, you know, kind of going toe to toe with the Proud Boys um, or whoever. Um, that's a different kind of battle there. Um, I'm just saying that these are these are not the same thing, but they are they are both contributing. And and 
the degree and the balance and ratio uh, that you want to use and how much you contribute to the real world is up to you as an artist, uh, up to you as a human being, and, and you decide how much you can take. I mean, I would also, this is the thing I keep saying to people, also, as quiet as it's kept, there's still a global pandemic happening. So uh -huh, yeah, going to a yeah. protest is not the same thing as going to a protest would have been six months ago. So, you true, know, I think there's also true. an aspect of this that's like, take true. care of yourself. Yeah. And if you have other people depending on you, maybe not, maybe there's other, you can figure out other ways to uplift voices and to True. share information. So, uh, although, you know, at the protest that I saw, all the protesters were wearing masks, the cops were not. Oh, yeah. The see, that's, that's, you know, that's, 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 it's a complicated, I mean, the other thing is like you have to get to the protest and you know, who knows what you mm -hmm. have to deal with on the way there, too. So, well, I walked, but okay. <laughs> yeah. So, there's, I'm going to combine these two questions. Any plans to write a YA novel? Because there's a middle school teacher who would love to teach who would love to teach a book by you, and oh. then also connected to that is a question about books you read as a teenager, the teenager that you recommend to younger to younger uh, readers, or books, uh, that read. books that you read could be teenager or as a kid. Mm -hmm. that you recommend. All right. Uh, one, I'm gonna do take you plan this... to write YA novels? Uh, I don't plan to write anything. I write. Um, you know, I did not plan to write about you know. Uh, tentacles attacking New York City. Um, <laughs> no one plans that. Um, but uh, so yeah, I, I can't. And, and I hope that you are not hearing this. But uh, the sound in the background, um, which sounds like gunshots, is no. It is our neighborhood fire illegal fireworks person. Um, every neighborhood in New York has an illegal person shooting off a, a not illegal person a person shooting off illegal fireworks um, around basically all night. Um, I don't know why it just happens. It's a New York. Oh, New York. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So it's not gunshots. Just so you know. Always doing, always doing a little extra. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I don't plan to write a YA novel, but I mean, if it happens, then it will happen. Um, so maybe. Um, and what was the second question? I'm sorry, I completely forgot that fast. Uh, books that you, from when your younger years, teenager, kid, that you would recommend to readers now? Um, so... Most of what I read as a teenager was terrible. Um, like most teenagers, I had terrible taste. Plus also since people were recommending me um, kind of books from a list, um, you know, 99% of the science fiction and fantasy that I read was by cishet white dudes um, who periodically tossed in people of color as jokes and so on. So I won't recommend 99% of them. Um, I will say I discovered Octavia Butler um, in, she had started writing in the late seventies. I didn't discover her till like sometime mid eighties. Um, and uh, the first book by her that I read uh, was whitewashed on its cover. So I didn't actually realize she was a black woman writing about black people for a while. Um, really once I started reading the book, but um, I didn't pick it up on that, that basis. But nowadays you can find, yeah, I know. Um, nowadays you can find books by Octavia Butler with black people on the cover. Um, I highly recommend those to everyone. Um, she isn't writing particularly at a YA, YA audience, um, but a lot of the questions that I had begun to have about race um, happened at that point in my life developmentally and um, what she was writing spoke to those questions. So um, it's probably a great thing for uh, young adults to read. Everybody should read Octavia Butler, but that's, you know, that's a good age to start basically. Um, off the top of my head, we'll stick with that. That's, that's all I can think of. If you think of another, please, uh... Go. Uh, you can bring it up later. Uh, okay. I'm also worried about your groceries. Weirdly, Is I don't know what's going on with the groceries. Maybe they just decided to like fake me out with the text. Sometimes as a, as they a, show up like half an hour later. So who knows? as a parent and as and as much as grocery delivery is important to my household right now, I'm a little bit like we need to like get let's chat with the driver and see what's happening. Uh, <laughs> uh, you start, it's funny you said this before we started. <laughs> I don't know if you want to say it again. Somebody's asking both of us: Is there a question you're tired of answering? <laughs> um, I have said this in other interviews, please, please, please don't ever ask me like, where do you get your ideas or any variation on where do you get your ideas? Because every interview done by someone that has not prepared their interview questions well features a variation on that question. Um, and, and the core of the question is like, how are you an artist? That's really what that, that's how I interpret that mm -hmm. um, is how does your artist brain work? And I'm like, if I knew, I'd tell everybody so that the whole world would turn into artists and that would fix a lot of stuff. Um, it might create other problems though. Um, the artist apocalypse. Hmm. Anyway, um, <laughs> yep, new book. Okay, there we go. Anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, 
I don't, there's no answer to that question. That's a, how do you do the things you do? And if we could explain it, we would not be artists, we would be neuroscientists. So that's it for me. All right. um, I mean, I feel like I, I accept the fact that because of the work I've chosen, I get asked all the sort of like one-on-one racism questions. And I sort of <laughs> now, I accept the fact that I'll answer them so you don't ask the black people at your office or your school, those the people you work with, like ask me, yeah. I'll, I'll take them. So I can't really, even though sometimes I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, can't black people be racist? I think that's probably one of those, but mm -hmm. I just accept the fact that, um, that that's my job. Mm -hmm. I would say questions I get annoyed by are questions that are Googleable, mm. like, like that I've, that I've already done, I've already done this. Like I've already mm -hmm. done this. So like if somebody starts with, so first of all, tell me, how did you get your start as a comedian? I just feel like, or is, unless this is some sort of 9,000 Vanity Fair profile, 9,000 mm. word rant, I don't know mm. that we're gonna, I don't know why that would be in this, you know, article. Do you, you know? just send them a link to your book or do you just send them a link to one of your early comedy specials or something? Cause that's what I, I would do, I but I'm an silently, asshole. Uh, I just so. to check out of the interview. I just go, okay, I'm not gonna really. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Yeah, um, I, I, one time I sent a, a interview full of links back to one <laughs> one very persistent annoying uh interviewer um yeah. because i can be an asshole sometimes i that's own it that's, you that's that's what you that's what makes you so lovable <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're just too kind <laughs> um, anyway. uh what this is a question i'm curious about what's because this is super specific what science fiction or fantasy trope do you feel is oversaturated or overdone specifically in afrofuturism Afrofuturism has not been around long enough to have saturation like that. <laughs> so, where's my mic? Where's my mic? I'm yeah, I, well, you, I'm, you, I'm sure you've got. Oh, okay. Um, please don't. It looks expensive. Um, yeah. So, Afro, Afrofuturism has been around for not even a full generation. Um, you know, when I was a kid, it wasn't even literary. Um, when I was a kid, it was all like uh, music and movies, like Brother from Another Planet and Parliament Funkadelic. I mean, it still is those things. Things. Um, these days, I would say Janelle Monet is kind of carrying the Afrofuturism torch in music, um, but there are other musicians who are doing, you know, kind of equally powerful stuff. Um, so, you know, I think that's, it, it's too soon for that. Um, ask that question in like maybe another hundred years. <laughs> so, so put that sure. in your Google Calendar reminder to ask that question in another hundred years. Um, yeah. If I live to be 147, all y'all can ask me then. <laughs> if, the, if, the, if, the, if the country lives to be another 100 years, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, what, so somebody's complimenting you, but the big question is, is that they're, about, they're, they're, they're talking about how your character relationships are the most realistically written and compelling I've ever read. Wow. What do you enjoy most slash find most difficult about writing them? Uh... Is there a part of it that's like, I got sort of like I say, time to make the donuts. Like I have to do this to get to the next place, even mm -hmm. though I don't want to, even though it's sort of drudgery. And what part mm -hmm. is like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go to sleep tonight because I'm. this is the part I want to do. No, about writing the characters, it's it's writing that's the difficult part. You know, if I've like, if I've spent the last hour yelling at people on Twitter, I want to keep yelling at people on Twitter. I don't want to go write. Um, you know, because there's a certain visceral satisfaction in yelling at people on Twitter. Um, and writing is just hard. It's labor and it's not, you don't get that satisfaction. The dopamine rush is not there. Um, but, um, you know, writing the characters themselves, the characters are, if I've done it right, the characters come alive in my head and they just start talking to each other. And then I'm just like transcribing what they're doing. Um, so it's not really like a there's there's not a specific thing that I'm trying to do there. Um, it just happens, if that makes sense. It does make so, sense. Okay. Yeah, it's funny. I just think that's, I mean, that's true. Writing is the hard part. I had a hard part. Every writer talks about that. And yet you clearly eventually get to the place of writing. Mm -hmm. How, why are you better than other people? <laughs> How am I supposed to answer a question like that? Uh, you're very kind. Um, I almost yeah, got a this, spit take. Was, was uh, yeah, almost, yeah. Um, but like, you know, there's probably more good writers in the world, but a lot of people can't get past the like, I don't want to, you know what I'm saying? I mean, but like, becoming a good, whatever kind of artist that you are is a matter of practice. You, you seek out training when you don't really know what the hell you're doing. You find that training from people who seem to know what they're doing. You 
follow their advice. You experiment and you try things on your own. You write and write and write until you can't write anymore. Um, there's a saying in, in the writing world, which is that you know everybody that, that kind of becomes a good writer um, first wrote a million words of crap. Um, well, there are many, many opportunities out there for you to write as much crap as you wanna. There's fanfic, there's like all these things out there. Don't put your stuff online until you feel comfortable facing critique. Um, you know, but that said, um, you know, it, it's really just a matter of, of practice. It's just, you know, I, I, I am of two minds about whether a thing like natural talent exists. Um, because at the end of the day, if you don't develop it, what good is it? So you've got to work to make that natural talent into a thing. And is it possible that someone who doesn't have the natural talent can also work and make it a thing? Probably. So, you know, it, it's just, it's like anything else in the world. To get good, you have to, you have to work your ass off um, and you have to take a lot of crap and you, you always have to kind of try and continually improve. Um, you don't ever assume that you are at a point of like uh, perfection and you never need to continue working on it because um, that's when you write a dud or, you know, whatever. Um, I, I will write a dud at some point in the future. Um, I'm going to get tired, whatever. Um, but I will try my best not to put that out into the world. And then that will go into my little file of the million words of crap and no one will see it but me. Do you think you do you think you'd be able to figure out if it was a, that it was a dud before it was at your publishers? You know what I mean? Like, do you really think you'd be able to go that you'd be able to weed out the dud before before the New York Times got to it? You know what I mean? Like, probably, but it might take some time. Um, one of the things that I've kind of noticed. Like, I get, let me start. Let me stop you. Here's okay. a question. Are there thousands of words, are there words that you've written for like the city we became that you're like, that that you were like, suddenly like, what, whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And does that stuff get deleted or is it just on a file somewhere in the lockbox at, um, at, at a bank? I, I put them into Eclipse file. Um, anytime that like, like I took whole chapters out of, I do this with every book. Um, for once for one of my books, I scrapped 90,000 words. The, the final book was supposed to be like 120,000. Um, so I got like basically three quarters of the way through. It was like, this is wrong. This just isn't right. And, and I had to toss that book and start over from scratch. Um, and you just have to learn like, like when you've done this enough, there's a little, there's a little voice in the back of your head that's like, this is bullshit. And you have to listen to, the, it, now granted, as an artist, that voice is often there when it's not. Um, but you, you do have to listen to like that voice. And when you hear it really starting to nag you like, no, really, I meant it this time. Um, then, <laughs> then you try and shut things away. But I put it into a clips file or folder um, and I save it in case I change my mind. Um, because sometimes it is wrong. Um, sometimes the little voice is wrong. So, um, but mostly I listen to it and if it's telling me, yeah, this isn't bad, then, then I know I'm okay. <laughs> oh God, I sound really, really crazy. No, it's good. <laughs> okay. What, is there, a, is there a, like a, like when you're, when you're, when you, with the city we became, is there like a truth that you're trying to get through there? Is there like one, like one guiding thing that is pushing you through that you're like, if this is what, this is what I want the reader to take from it. This is the thing that I would like to be, the truth I want to be in the world that emerges through this book specifically. And I just asked that because this book feels like you wrote it a week ago. <laughs> you know, you know. Wow. So is, is there a is there a truth that you're like this is the guiding principle that the book is based on, or the thing that I want people to walk away with when this when they finish reading? No. <laughs> um, at, at the end of the day, I'm trying to tell a good story. Um, my definition of good story is, you know, it's a story that makes you feel something. It's a story that is true and honest about the, the way that the world works and the way that people work. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I literally just want to tell a really good story. Um, and, you know, that's what I think, you know, particularly for genre writers, um, we're not necessarily trying to get at any kind of great deep truths or, you know, whatever, then leave the literary people to do that. Um, but we just try and tell good stories. And if we do it well, then, then it has power, whether we intend it or not. All right. Well, I think we have to leave it there. That's, <laughs> uh, I mean, I can, you know, I think that's, I think we're all done, but thank you for Sounds talking like to a me. Good it, was all right. nice to, it was nice to meet you finally. <laughs> 
it was nice to see you again. Yeah. And thank <laughs> you for being thank you for being willing to do this. I mean, I only did it because I was like, I haven't talked to Nora in a while. And it'd be <laughs> and normally she's too busy to talk to me because she's writing 1500 words and she doesn't have time. So well, you also I, text I faster than I do. That's really what it comes down to is like I'm I'm really good at like regular typing, but texting, I am like, uh duh, duh, uh, uh. yeah, I, I've never like I can't do it. I don't That's know how right. you do it. So we could I mean, actually I, like I, pick up know, the phone and call each other, but we're too Gen X for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, it, well, that will close on the laugh from Melissa. <laughs> so, laugh from Melissa so. It's true though, isn't it? Hey. <laughs> hey, I love the Black Lives Matter sign too. Oh yeah, that's yeah, Just casually that's right. in the background. That's how we do it in this house. Casual Black Lives Matter sign. <laughs> oh, okay. Perfect. Yes, yeah, next to the crayon box with all the colors. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right.